bring it back. Welcome to the Endurance Town USA Project. This podcast, along with our blogs, vlogs, and adventure team, travel around the USA both creating and sharing the stories of human beings, changing lives, and communities through endurance sports and outdoor adventure. Follow us by subscribing today to reconnect and rediscover your own why as we explore the people and the places that make the endurance lifestyle where we call home. This is Endurance Town USA. Hey guys, I'm here at Endurance Town USA with my good friend Lauren Mears, who Hi. is a habit coach and a love boss and a good friend of mine. And uh, this is part of the mini series that we have going on called Making Peace With. So today we're going to talk about making peace with alcohol. Yeah, with booze. <laughs> yes. And um, it's a little bit or can be sometimes a heavy subject. Uh, but we're going to shed some light on it, and we're going to talk candidly about it today and give people some tools, yeah, tricks, and tell people a little bit about your story and maybe a little bit of mine. So let's go ahead and dig in, shall we? Okay, let's do it. Okay. I'm ready. Cool. So first I want to <laughs> tell our audience who you are and a little bit about your story. So if we can kind of backtrack into your life, yeah. um, tell me where you are born and give me a little bit of your growing up history. Sure. I mean... California kid. So I was born in Los Angeles, moved up to Northern California when I was about seven. Okay. The younger sister, her parents were still married. So we had just a very mm. wholesome, you know, mm. just fun childhood. We lived on half an acre. So I spent a lot of time just being a fun, you know, just being a kid and running mm. around. And my sister and I are very close. And from a very early age, I was like just a very sensitive kid, you know, had a lot of feelings had, um, was very aware of like the energy and the emotions of people around me. Mm. That's the best way to put it now. But okay. at the time I was probably just like constantly overstimulated by things and didn't really have the words or understanding for how I was feeling. Interesting. But now I would say a lot of that's just, um, highly sensitive, able to have a lot of empathy for people, um, and also be very observant. And so I was constantly, sensing and picking up on dynamics of the people around me and the behaviors and, and uh, was there that, turmoil in the house or were, what was there so uh, an environment that maybe was part of this no, no no my actual household was very very stable okay like very secure like everything was in order um maybe a little bit of like image management you know of like things wanting to look really in order, but they actually like were in order. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think what I picked up a little bit, or maybe what was modeled is like a lot of, um, a lot of effort to make things be really nice you okay. know, and be in order. Okay. And maybe I think what, just like the, some of those perfectionist tendencies, high achiever, high expectations, um, not really anything that's really out of the ordinary for a lot of people who are able yeah. to live, um, upper middle class, you know, it's like you kind of have these standards of what you're supposed to do and these expectations of right. being in line um, mm -hmm. and doing the best you can. And that to me, um, so that seemed very normal. I mean, okay. maybe it's normal for some people, maybe that's someone else, you know, maybe it's not the same story for someone else, but the day to day was really good. Um, and school, school, school life, good school life was good. Okay. I mean, kind of like kind of a dork, you know, so I think there's any dorks listening it's like we know what that feels like you feel like you kind of don't fit in yeah um which I think is a human feeling I don't think I think everyone Agreed. even people who we might say oh that person really has it together they don't fit in somewhere so right. I think that's actually a feeling that connects us but definitely at some point in your life if not multiples everyone has felt that oh yeah without a doubt and I think there's great power in tapping into that feeling it's wildly uncomfortable to feel as though you don't belong but there were times where what I didn't belong to, like popular group or whatever, you know, those situations as kids, it wasn't necessarily something that I wanted to be a part of. Hmm. It's not like I really aligned with those behaviors or with what those people were doing or where they were spending their time. It was just the very contrasting feeling that I didn't fit there. Okay. And sometimes if we're consumed by the feeling of not fitting, it doesn't really matter what we're trying to fit into. Like that matters less than how aware we are and how uncomfortable it is to not belong. Did you do things growing up like 
play sports or participate in community things that help mold who you are? Yeah, sports for sure. Sports, okay. My parents encouraged us, especially as we got into high school, that there was some sport or activity that we were involved with. And so if it wasn't an organized school team sport, it was some outdoor activity or something that we um, chose, you know, that, w- that interested you us. Into? I did a lot of, um, I ran track for oh, four years as yes. a runner, a sprinter. And awesome. my, Sprint. si- my sister was into horses. So she like had, did horseback riding. So that was, so, I mean, that's an example of like not a team sport, but just yeah. my parents really encouraged us to explore and find things that we wanted to do. So I think it's great, you know, team sports are not for everybody, but track was fun. That was like a good balance of independence and team sport. Mm. Played basketball and volleyball. Was not as good as either one of those. You thought I would be because I was tall. I kind of like I wa- I kind of cruised into high school like at about five nine. So it was already wow. yeah. I was like the dorky tall kid, you know, until high school. But I didn't have, I didn't really have a drive for the competitiveness of the sports at the time. Like I felt, I was like rageless. Is <laughs> a good word? Like I didn't have any edge. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the like playing basketball, for example, like wasn't really fun for me, and. There's also now I understand this concept of like mastering a skill, Mm -hmm. right? Or putting Mm -hmm. time into shooting free throws. Like that didn't really appeal to me. Mm. It kind of felt like it was a box I was checking. Running, I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's amazing, like the stuff I would eat before like a track meet. Hamburger, (laughs) the Carl's Jr. hamburger. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. It just, (laughs) and that I was able to run fast. I've never been able, you know, I can't run that fast now. So um, high school was good. I, I would say that there was that feeling of pressure, you know, like I think having high expectations can be a good thing or having performance expectations around school, but having it, if you're wired to take things really personal, if you're really sensitive, if your brain doesn't really shut off, like mine doesn't, it's like a setup for a lot of rumination, a mm-hmm. lot of worry kind mm-hmm. of, you know, if you can look at things through a lot of different lenses, mine was probably pretty fear-based not really rooted in anything I had gone through, but just this sense of there was things to fear Interesting. or waiting for the other shoe to drop. Was there a religion in your household? Yeah. Okay. Went to church every Sunday. Okay. Yeah. And then were there other teachings or lifestyles where um, you felt exposed to things that were maybe breeding that fear mindset or was it just, you know, you were absorbing the vibe around you, whether it be family, it was a lot friends, of, I think it was community. a lot of the vibe. Um, I can't really put my finger on one thing. Um, and we were raised Catholic and even a lot of like that Catholic guilt, that wasn't something my parents emphasized. Like we really had a very positive experience with that. So I think it was just, um, it was like a hypervigilance mm-hmm. that was really fatiguing for me, mm-hmm. constantly worrying. And because especially around high school, there's so much energy. There's so much, yes. people are going through so much. Yes. Everyone's kind of off their rockers a little right. bit, right? And so Hormones. you're trying to find stable relationships or friendships with people that aren't really stable themselves or are going through their own things. And right. so it, I grew up in an area where most people were pretty well off. And so that breeds a different sort of problem. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. problems you're facing are much different than like not having food on the table, getting, yeah. you know, getting your electricity turned off. But the problems were a little bit more deep seated and much more related to the stuff that you're sweeping under the rug. Mm, right. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whether it's like parents, you know, and other, you know, other friends, families, whether it was like, you know, marital like discourse or there was substance abuse or someone's dad was like a real jackass and like really hard on them. Like there was that was the stuff that was putting pressure on my peers and I. Was drinking a thing in high school? Yeah, it was a thing. It was definitely something that I didn't really touch till the end of high school. Okay. Um, Part of it was probably time, you know, like I wasn't going out to parties on the weekends. That wasn't something that was part of what was like socially acceptable for me to do. And a lot of my friends were also like high achievers, athletes, student government. Like we were busy with school related things or family things. And so... I also wasn't missing out on big parties with like my close friends. Okay. Um, I think as people, you lived in a community where that wasn't really going well, on. I think it was happening. It was probably like at people's houses. Some parents would go out of town and someone okay. would have people over and drink. I did go to parties and also not drink there. Like I would drive someone. Like, it didn't really interest me. Um, but I also like, you were it, so responsible. It was, it was that, but it wasn't really the responsible. Like it was like my righteous 
like stance it was kind of like I was looking to not get in trouble huh. like I was looking to like stay in line Got that it. was the easiest thing for me Got to it. not rock the boat okay so later on towards the end of high school I think one it's like I think it's normal to want to experiment with things yeah. I don't think it's that weird I and, still do I'm now, almost 51 <laughs> so I think it's not it's not even a judgment of like I think no. most kids in high school alcohol is available somewhere right. and they try it at some point mm -hmm. so it's not a judgment mm -hmm. on who was doing it the whole time in high school or not it was more of exposure it was exposure it was peer group you mm -hmm. know like as everyone yep. was kind of getting older it wasn't freshman year it's like now it's senior year we've worked our booties off right we've mm -hmm. gotten into colleges we've kind of we're, we're checking the boxes and we're proud of ourselves but also I mean I'm tired <laughs> right because not only am I doing a lot my brain never shuts off Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly something spinning up there always. Mm. And sometimes it's my own discomfort. And sometimes it's simply the discomfort I'm picking up from you because I'm spending a lot of time with you mm -hmm. or you're my good friend and you're going through something really funky with your boyfriend and I'm hearing all about it. And like, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in it with you now. Right. So what ended up happening is like, it kind of felt like, oh, we can kind of breathe a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? So I think there, that was natural. And also it was fun, um, you know, drinking a beer is like kind of fun, mm -hmm. especially the first time you do it and you don't know what's happening. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's not that, it's not that strange of an experience, but I think it kind of seemed, it became a little bit more normalized as I got towards the end of high school. Okay. And did you take that with you to college then? Oh yeah. Okay. I did do a senior trip to Europe. Oh, in between. Then, yeah. That summer before, before I went you to graduated. Poly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I graduated high school and then we went, it was July to August. It was actually like a month before 9-11 that we came Whoa. back. So that's a really interesting memory I have of leaving San Francisco mm. and like all of our parents and siblings. And this was like a huge trip for a lot of people. I had never gone really out of the country without my parents at all. And we went with a couple of teachers that were chaperones and maybe 15 or 16 of us from my high school class, like all like really good students. We're all like AP students mm -hmm. <laughs> going on this like tour of Europe. Um, but I remember like they were in the terminal with us, yeah. which like, it's never not, happens never anymore. gonna happen again yeah. um so i just remember that was really interesting and we came back like in august 2001 wow yeah mm -hmm. uh, so that was my first exposure i think in some ways like i mean my parents probably knew i was drinking or at least had drank mm -hmm. or if they didn't think i had they were in denial but after going to europe it was like legal to drink so it was kind of like it bridged a little bit of that like the rule breaking it was like i was clear with my parents that i had drank yeah yeah, but you didn't need to like have a conversation about it. It just happened. Like it was common knowledge. It was like going to happen and it okay. did. Mm -hmm. And like nothing got out of control. I mean, we'd yeah. go to pubs, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. but um, again, around responsible people that weren't looking for trouble. Right, right. You know? So when you went to college at Cal Poly, what yeah. were you studying? Psychology. No, nice. <laughs> yeah. Trying to understand your own brain or others or both? Just, yeah, just the fascination. I don't yeah. know, just wanting to, help, wanting to find solutions, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, wanting to help people, very aware that people suffer. Mm -hmm. You know, like by the time I was 18, I was very aware of like that suffering looked really different to different people. Mm. But the things I would see like would stick with me. You know, okay. like someone who, I don't know, it just little things that, that you can tell like affect how people feel about themselves. Right. You know, like you grow up in like an area where like everyone has a lot of money spending on things. And if you don't have those same jeans, those same Nikes, like you stick out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was aware of what made people feel different, even if they really weren't different. And I could see myself in that. Mm -hmm. And also I knew what it felt like to be uncomfortable. And I was usually able to pick up on that same vibe from other people. Got it. And, and you I was to kind be of part sick of, of like kind of the bullshit of people like just being superficial, you know, mm -hmm. being materialistic. Like that to me was not how, that wasn't a priority in my family. But when you want to fit in, like you're going to want your mom to buy you certain jeans, you know, mm -hmm. that's just mm -hmm. like, I think just the, just the peer pressure, but also just our society, you know, what we focus on, what we think is important or what we, what we yeah. tell people is important um, really is so far from what really is important. Yeah. Right? And I do see that there is a shift happening thank goodness, yeah. you know, in my lifetime to that people yeah. are steering away from that. And for sure, the younger generation is less and less inclined to care about any of that. Yeah. You know, if anything, it's the opposite, which is like living by your values and understanding yeah. the impact you're having and all that. And it's so awesome. Yeah. And you're to be in you this know, those, time. Those are things like the environmental. I grew up in a really beautiful area. 
outside of Sacramento where it's like, you know, oak trees, like I, like nature was all around us, but there wasn't that awareness of like How lucky global we warming are. or just like your, your carbon footprint. Like those weren't conversations we were having, you know, mm-hmm. it was kind of, there was enough room up there for sprawl. And so that was kind of the mindset a little bit, like mm-hmm. the bigger, the better. And in San Luis Obispo, it's, that's different, you know, like mm-hmm. the value of things is much different here. Mm-hmm. What you get for your money, real estate, you know, like the whole demographics different. So I came down to Cal Poly in 2001, really didn't have a plan of sticking around after college, but I ended up sticking around and getting into the financial industry where I worked for eight years, wealth management and financial planning. Were you drinking at this point? Yeah. I mean, I drank a Social. lot. I would say the big, I would say I was definitely my freshman year. I was like shot out of a cannon. Oh, okay. I was so freedom, freedom. And it wasn't Got even it. freedom, like an excitement for life. It was like, Ugh, I'm so tired. Oh, a release. Like I need a break. Mm. And then drinking would give me a breather mm-hmm. really from myself, right. From my thoughts, from, from my your busy mind. Brain. Yeah. Um, and then not, I didn't, I mean, I'm sure I had consequences early on. You know, like I was able to hold my liquor. And so I didn't get, um, I'm sh- I definitely had blackouts, but like I was partying kind of like everybody else. Mm-hmm. Some of like my girlfriends in the dorms, maybe they, you know, could only have a couple shots and then they were kind of done for the night or, you know, passed out or whatever. But like, yeah. I could kind of hang in there. I could kind of go the, go the distance and then get up in the morning and not feel that terrible. But this that, is all social drinking at this social point. Social drinking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's like 18 years old. Your body's able to be more resilient in general to poison it feels like right so I didn't have the consequences of my drinking till probably towards maybe just towards the end of college like it became harder to keep the system up and I've always been a binge drinker I've always consumed multiple drinks Mm -hmm. you know with the desire to get drunk or to like feel drunk um and to take the edge off like that's what I was looking for was like Mm. quieting the noise and letting myself have a good time I've always been pretty like social and like outgoing. I mean, I like to dance. I like music. Like that was kind of happening with or without the booze. Okay. But the booze just made it more fun. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted like anything like going to the beach, going on a picnic, anything I could do where I could also be drinking. It just was more enjoyable. And so you do that over a period of time and then you start to like not really be able to do anything without it. Yeah. Well, it becomes the norm. And it's the lifestyle that is built around that. So however it comes into your life, and Mm -hmm. this is with all substances of all types, right? However it's introduced into your life, it was meeting some sort of need, right? For you, you're saying to calm your mind and your thoughts. Oh, yeah. But then it becomes integrated into your regular activities, right? Whether it's social life or lifestyle. lifestyle. And then it becomes normal, yeah. And your friend base and your family, whatever the environment is you're hanging out yeah. in, that's a normal piece of it. Yeah. And so at what point did it become where you said, huh, I might be on a slippery slope yeah. here? Probably my late 20s. Okay. Um, I was working, again, in finance. Then like 2008 happens, which is like a huge economic crash. And so I'm seeing, again, there's kind of that feeling of like, not only am I probably doing too much, Mm -hmm. too little time. Like I'm already on the hamster wheel of life, right? I'm Mm -hmm. already trying to do all the right things and it feels hard. Um, You're still living in slow, still living in slow. And so now what's happened is a lot of people have left, like really no one stuck around. Everyone moved away. So I was one of the few people that stayed and it was like, okay, so now people go downtown when they're young professionals, like there's like, they're still drinking, there's wineries, like it kind of looks a little different, but it's still kind of the same. Mm -hmm. You don't really grow out of that, or at least I didn't. It just kind of continued to be part of what I did. Okay. But I was also seeing like real stress. Like I was already kind of a high strung person and then experiencing true stress of like helping people manage their finances during like a lot of responsibility for a young person. Like it was very, and I just took it all on. And I think something, you know, we've talked about this a lot in the past too, just like boundaries of knowing, being able to check in with yourself and saying like, Hey, am I overloaded? Do I have too much on my plate? Like, do I need to say no to something? Can I, do I need to like go to bed early tonight? Like those sort of normal adult or human check-ins that some people are really good at. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any framework for that. That wasn't something that was modeled to me. That wasn't something I learned in school. Mm -hmm. Right. So I learned the hard way of what that looks like of what burnout syndrome really is, what it feels like when you're just 
Well, you were still of the generation where that was a badge of honor, though, by the way. Like, well, and then you it get very in, much was. Yes. Yeah, you it know, was. Bragging rights. It, oh, I didn't sleep either. And we're doing all these things. Definitely. And everyone's and then, like talking about especially it. Especially in an industry like the financial industry, which can still be pretty old school in mm -hmm. some ways, right? So there is that, there is a workaholic energy there mm -hmm. for sure. And so I just ate it up. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because I was used to that pendulum swinging, you know, like some day, like on some evenings, like weekends, I would be out or like having drinks or relaxing or having a good time and then work hard, play hard. Mm -hmm. And so that became, and then I, you know, started the first race I trained for was the first marathon that you hosted. I was training for the half marathon. And again, I burned, I got, I gave myself a stress fracture <laughs> you were in my going ankle hard. and couldn't run because I was training so hard just for the training runs. Right. right. Like I did not you have a way to calibrate to myself. <laughs> yeah. I just, there was no kindness to myself. Yeah. That's what was much, yeah. that was really non-existent. Self-compassion. Yeah. Or just like, Hey, like you're dealing with a lot, like yeah. it's okay. And I think there were people in my life that were saying that to me, mm. like, it's not like I, I mean, my parents are very like loving and encouraging and have always applauded me for my, for the good things that I'm doing. So it's not like I wasn't getting that somewhere. I just wasn't hearing it. You were self-driving this. Oh yeah. It wasn't coming from an external environment. It was, it was like, the a, only it was, it was a head. hard wiring that was fueled by c conditions I continued to choose. Got it. Got yeah. it. And I think it takes, you know, if you're working a nine to five and you're getting your butt kicked, mm -hmm. I think, I don't want to call it a badge of honor, but I think that there's something useful in having a job as an adult that makes you really uncomfortable. Yeah. I think it's important to experience that. Because you learn a lot. And to be able to say, is about this, what not to do. Is this working for me? Yeah. And not just like, hey, this job like sucks. You know, mm -hmm. people do that sometimes. Like this job yeah. sucks. I can't do this. It's like, well. I think it's important to get your ass kicked a little bit, mm -hmm. but be able to know when to leave. Mm -hmm. And that's been something, a very hard lesson I've learned is like, when is this like, when do I need to get off the ride? Yeah. Or when is, or like, I'm on a ride I shouldn't even be on. And I would even add to that. When do I have to get clear with myself that it's a ride I'm directing? Right. So yeah. there's being on the ride strapped in at Magic Mountain going 100 miles an hour right. and being like puking your guts out and all the things, <laughs> but you're still, you don't, don't get off the ride. Yeah. God forbid. Right. Right. Or that sense of I've got to get off the ride, but it's like someone else's fault. I'm on the ride. Like I'm strapped yeah. in and I have no control because you know that that's also not the case. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, just, I think we've all experienced that. I don't feel like I'm a victim. I'm mm -hmm. sure I'm certain that I had that feeling at different times Yeah, that I was at the mercy of the situations I was in. I was at the mercy of what the boss was saying, you know, mm -hmm. it's like that. And that's kind of true, but then that means we have to pull from other resources, right? Like if you're dealing with someone that's really difficult, the, the answer isn't to get out of that situation and never see that person again. Right. That might sound like the best idea, but that's not real life. We're not just going to run from adversity or from people that we don't agree with. Like that's not the answer to cocoon yourself into a place that's safe and cozy, but it's being able to pull tools. And, and really what it's about is like being honest and asking for help. Yeah. Saying, Hey, I'm dealing with like this situation at work. Hey, I'm dealing with this relationship issue. Like being able to be open enough with someone that you trust. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't doing any of that. I just kept stuffing everything, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I'm sure I was talking, but like, not really. It's like, I was internalizing a lot of that stress and that I was dying for a break. And then my break would be drinking. Ah, uh, Yeah. So it was like right. this cycle of, I got to take the foot off. You know, it's like, I'm like full throttle. And then yeah. I like hit the break yeah. and I drink or have a good time. It's but kind then... of the whole concept of happy hour now that you're saying it out loud. <laughs> That's really interesting because yeah, like you... oh, happy yeah. hour it's like five right, is five yeah. to six o'clock. So you do this workday routine mm -hmm. or obligations. Right. Oh, yeah. And then it's, uh, I want to know when that was invented. Now I'm gonna have to look that up. And then it was like, okay, now we take our foot off the gas and we do yeah. this other thing. And yeah. absolutely without a doubt, it was the normal thing to do. Yeah. You know, not everybody's been exposed to alcohol, obviously, but like as a society, it is com completely accepted yeah. and the public norm that these things exist and whole, you yeah. know, lifestyles are built around them. Yeah. So at what point did you go from, I'm a happy hour person and now maybe on the, the weekends I'm doing my thing, whatever yeah. that looks like to this is a problem. Like what did, yeah. what was that moment where you said, oh, huh, there were a few moments, something's not right here. 
I think what it really started to be is I started to feel just as awful when I was drinking oh. than when I wasn't. So you took your foot off the gas, you were drinking, and you're like, shit, I still feel like crap. Yeah. And I think... I think it's, I think it was a combination. I think physically, like I was, you know, not getting old, but I was getting older. So like mm-hmm. the whole work hard, play hard was starting to kick my ass. Right. Like I was like teaching fitness classes. I was working, I was doing all, like I was doing too much. Mm-hmm. It was a total recipe for burnout. Mm-hmm. And so I was physically, I couldn't keep up with myself mm-hmm. and I kept pushing. And so my body was really beat. And then I, I felt rattly. Like I felt like, 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 I felt like I, I had less and less of a handle over my life, didn't have a handle on anything. And so that's where a lot of that image management of like, just getting up and suiting up and doing it regardless of how I felt. I took that, you know, it's like, I take everything to the distance, like I go, I go full out. And so having any sense of moderation or backing off is not something that I wanted to do. So what, ha- what ended up happening is, I started feeling like after a long day of work, instead of being like, oh yeah, let's go like grab dinner and a couple beers and like catch up. It was like, oh man, I like really like need a drink. Mm. Like I needed that. I needed something to take me like outside of myself. Ding. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, it and, and also then when I would have that first, like it was usually wine. Like I had a glass of wine and it did make me feel better for a really short period of time. So the relief it was giving me mm-hmm. from the stress mm-hmm. was getting smaller. Like that period, it was like maybe 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I need another one. Mm-hmm. And so it was just this dialogue, this kind of obsession. And if you look at addiction or, you know, alcohol abuse, it's like there's an obsession where you're thinking about drinking, mm-hmm. j- whether you're drinking or not. It wasn't like something out of my mind until I was doing it again. And then like, if you're a binge drinker like me, you're going full out. Like Mm -hmm. it's a whole night thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not coming home after happy hour and having dinner and going to bed. Like that's, it's like, I'm out till 10, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. or like I'm out till the bars close or, you know, it's like there was no moderation once I started. And that was always how I was wired with it. Like if you said to me, Hey, let's go have dinner. It's a Wednesday night. Okay. Okay. And we go to dinner and we're catching up. And I know that you're not going to drink a lot. Okay. And you're like, hey, do you want a glass of wine? And I'll be like, no. Mm-hmm. I don't want a glass of wine. So I would like not have wine. Okay. If we were having a bottle or two bottles or three bottles or going out later, sure. Okay. But like I was like literally like all or nothing. So it was a little bit like what's the point? If we're not going all in, yeah. what are we doing? It's not worth it. It's not worth the, it's not worth the calories oh. of the one glass of wine. Because I probably worked out that morning. I mean, it was like, it, it's really, it was really rationalization. It was just insanity of thought. Like yeah. that's not normal thinking, you know, it's like, I didn't think but... for one, I didn't on those nights that I drank multiple drinks. I never thought about the calories there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause that was, that was all, that was like programmed into what I was doing. It's interesting that the calories are part of the conversation, the internal dialogue oh, and yeah. with food and drugs and alcohol and oh, a yeah. lot of things that we can abuse ourselves with, like. There's so much woven together, yeah. right? Whatever substance we might choose, the conversations, the dialogue can be the same. It's just yeah. a different substance. And what I, you know, nothing is really unusual about my story because right. I have hundreds no, and thousands of normal. friends who have done the same thing with me Absolutely. and continue to do the same thing. And it may or may not be working for people that are mm-hmm. still doing it. And mm-hmm. I was one of those people, like it, 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 it didn't, it didn't end where it started. You know, like it was, and for me, you know, alcohol abuse is a progressive disease. Like it changes and it changes the person the longer they do it. And that's what I was feeling. Like, so back to what, like, I felt crappy kind of all the time, right? Like, and it was starting to be something that mentally was consuming me just as much as it was making me feel physically awful. And so I really got no relief, you Mm -hmm. know, because it's like, say I got to have a couple drinks. Well, then in the morning I feel awful. Like I was getting less and less wiggle room with this like beast. You know, what's interesting when you're explaining this, the visual I'm kind of getting that you started with, it's sort of following through is it's a conversation in your head and you want to change the dialogue or calm or soothe the the dialogue in your head, the internal conversation. So you introduce alcohol and you use it in a variety of ways. And then as you're using it more, 
the dialogue's changing, but yeah. it's not getting yeah. quiet. It's getting it's louder. It's getting louder. And the voice is, it's not even like a buzz like before where it was like just noise, busyness, a to-do list running through my head. I mean, that was like early on. Like at the end, it was like, you're the worst. What happened last night? Wow. What are you doing? Shame. You're spending so much shame for sure. Because with the story I was telling Burying myself is shame. that if I was a better person, if I had my shit together, if I was a good woman, if I was a working professional, wow. I wouldn't be doing any of this. Wow. And so I was just spiraling, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> around the drain in terms of my sense of worth. And then also the fact that I had had just enough strength or craziness or just bandwidth to keep it like it wasn't like I was really winning at anything but just enough was still afloat mm -hmm. in my life like I was still paying all my bills I made my car payment I paid my rent like I was earning. you weren't in jail I wasn't you know I never got a DUI I mean those were things that were just enough that everything was it was like all these spinning plates and so I was trying to keep it looking like it wasn't falling apart. And that made me feel again, really out of alignment with myself. Mm -hmm. Like what was really happening was so far from what it looked like was happening to most people. And then also people that I was close with that I was drinking with, or I was bartending a little bit at times too. Like that scene, I was like, I was having trouble. Like I was having issues. Right. So if you were out with me late at a bar, you would see me like not looking too hot, mm -hmm. not like coping too well with my life. And then of course, like the more we press anything down, whatever takes our, you know, whatever allows us to feel relief ends up being something that like allows all of those emotions to come out. So if I'm like, Oh God, I'm gonna have a glass of wine with Samantha, we're gonna like bitch a little bit and then relax and have some fun. And then what ends up being is like, then I'm crying, mm -hmm. right? Telling you about all the things in my life that suck. Mm -hmm. There was like, it was just a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it was like the pot was boiling over. And so it was like, I had this, I was seeing a, I was seeing an amazing therapist at the time and she was helping me with a lot of boundaries, like yeah. saying no, saying, Hey, you can't, I can't take something else on my plate right now. Like I need to have a little bit of downtime. Like she was giving mindfulness, breathing, meditation stuff. She was amazing. And she started saying things to me, like, you don't seem very happy. She's like, you've been complaining about your job for like nine months that you've been seeing me. She's like, I don't understand why you're still there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, excuse me. I think no one was talking to me directly like that, yeah. right? Or if they were, they were a jerk yeah. or an asshole. Mm -hmm. Like that guy just told me what he really thinks. Like he's awful, right? right? So there wasn't this honesty happening. Yes. I, I couldn't Including even put with my, yourself. Yeah, and I could definitely, and I couldn't put my finger on why I felt so terrible. It had to be someone else's fault. It had to be the fact I was doing too much for everybody else, which mm -hmm. was true, but I wasn't taking any ownership of that, right? So the story, like you said, that The loop yes comes playing, out of our mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, and if we're not saying no, it goes back to kind of what you're actually like consenting to. Correct. Like you might not say, yes, I'll take on that project, but by not standing up for yourself, by not having other people advocating for you, by not like not by not be, having a support system of people in your corner, you end up doing things that like, you're like, why the hell is this happening? Right. You know, yeah. so it's again, not an excuse, but saying yes or no, there's like all these gray areas in between that where we end up doing stuff that we really don't want to do. Yeah. Well, and if you have this deep sense of shame yeah. that is festering, yeah, then you feel like you need to say yes to all the things because right. you have to redeem yourself. So yes. it's part of the process of, I am going to become worthy through yeah. all these acts, whether right. they're my own accord or idea or not, or aligned by my right. values or not. But I have to overcome this shame. Yeah. Shame is that, a that, bitch. that plate, that, that, that tape playing in my head, um, was exhausting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I felt just really low. Like I felt like there was, and I, so I was, I would say in the last year that I was drinking, I was starting to have conversations saying something like, I think I have a problem mm. or I was, I was, being, were other people asking you, or is this, is again, you talking to you both? Wow. I did start saying it to people, but I also, my behavior was starting to change. Like when I was yeah. drinking, I wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. Like things where it seemed like it was just something where I'm suffering on the inside. Mm -hmm. Like I come home at night and I feel terrible. Like it was starting to affect my relationships with people. Mm -hmm. People maybe didn't want to do, didn't want to drink with me. Or I, I would
would like go into a situation and I wouldn't be able to like, like I've spent so much energy thinking about like, how can I keep a handle on this? Like, how can I go to this function and like not get drunk? Mm -hmm. And that takes up so much bandwidth. Like mm -hmm. if you're trying, you know, if you're at like a mixer or something social or party and you're trying so hard, like it's like I could snap the glass in half, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm trying so hard to be present. Mm -hmm. But all I'm thinking of is like, when can I get another drink? Mm -hmm. Like who's counting my drinks? Does anyone know? Yeah. Am I drinking? Am I outpacing people? Mm -hmm. Like, and so, but again, if you're around a lot of people that are drinking heavily, what is actually like kind of dysfunctional seems really normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, we support a binge culture lifestyle. Absolutely. You know, in our society, mm -hmm. we're told that like you kind of that old sex in the city, like you need to have your martinis with your girlfriends at the end of a hard day. And mm -hmm. so we're told that that's normal. And I and that was, that is self care. Yeah, and that, I was a big proponent of that. You know, yeah. I I loved, I loved the socialness of drinking. Mm -hmm. I loved going to bars. I loved going to restaurants. I loved bartending. I loved like I was like someone who was definitely a party girl. Like, in, and that was part of my identity. Mm -hmm. And then when that identity started to like kick me in the teeth, I was like, What do we do now that this like isn't working? And, and how so will I, I relate to people because I really love people. Yeah, like how am I gonna? And I think there was part of me, I still had a little bit of, I just was a high functioning, like, drinker, you know, like I had a problem, and I was spending a lot of energy trying to keep it together. And there were times, though, where I could, where I didn't drink, because I was binging, there were weeks where I'd be like, Oh, man, I need to take a break. And I could, I didn't have a oh, physical addiction every day that I was feeding. Got it. Um, it was much more, I mean, it was still an addiction, but it, it didn't, it didn't manifest for me. Like I was someone that needed a drink at the end of the day. Like I didn't have the shakes, but then I would be binging a couple times a month if it wasn't a couple times a week. So I want to talk about that just for a minute. Yeah. Um, I want to help myself and other people understand like what, when we think about alcoholism, mm -hmm. And I know you are an AA and you've mm -hmm. been sober for how long? Over four years. Yeah. yeah. So you are deep in the work. Yeah. But for a lot of people, including myself, we don't understand the gray area in between. Yeah. So I have alcoholics in my family mm -hmm. and I've had challenges with alcohol in the past. Yeah. Um, but I still, I drink socially and I'm not, I'm not a dry person. But when I think of alcoholism, or the stereotypical alcoholic, it's right. this extreme vision and, Person you know, under the bridge or in my instance, I do have family members that yeah. ended up in jail and yeah. ended up in the hospital and, and did have some extreme behaviors around yeah. alcohol and drug abuse. So for you, that wasn't the case. It didn't have to go to that level for you to understand there was a problem. So for all of us out there, including myself, like what should we be looking for in terms of our relationship with alcohol, drugs, or even food, like the yeah. addictive behavior, food, experience, exercise, exercise, money. Yeah. All of it. It's, I think when Where we need to step back and take a moment, yeah. what does that look like? I think it goes back to the feeling that you're trying to get rid of hmm. or what is okay. the feeling that you're looking to get more of and you're reaching for something outside yourself to numb the discomfort or to turn up, you know, like for me, sometimes I didn't necessarily want to numb out the stress. You want like to turn sometimes up party I wanted to turn up the party. Mm -hmm. Other times it was like, I needed to quiet down my mind or I felt really, you know, it's like, or I felt rattly needed a drink, take the edge off, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, it just really comes back to not being able to sit in an uncomfortable feeling enough to let it pass or long enough to decide what would be a healthy way to work through this. So a couple of things I'm getting out of that is one, and um, we've talked about this around um, a lot of different subject matters, yeah. but not feeling comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And then also not having the skills or the toolbox yeah. to how could I deal with this discomfort in a productive, healthy way? Like mm -hmm. what are my opportunities and options for doing it differently? So how did you learn those? I mean, again, a huge part of it was this therapist who I really, really loved. And what brought me in the doors to see her is not like why I kept coming, right? She started helping me unpack my baggage, kind of like okay. understanding things that continued to challenge me and how to let go of them or how to have an assertive conversation or how to say to be okay with the fact that maybe I was ready for a career change or something that felt really overwhelming to even 
run the whole tape through. It's like, okay, well, if I did want to have another job, how would I, where would I go look or like my resume? And then I would get really caught up in the weeds of all the little actions it would need to take in order to overwhelm, right? So overwhelming. And also um, worrying about what people, like who I'd be letting down. Mm. So when we have stronger boundaries, we're in our, we're aligned, but we're also in our like authenticity, like we're owning our story and what someone else may or may not need to do for them doesn't affect us. Right. And it doesn't mean that we don't care Mm -hmm. because I still feel it just as deeply, if not more for people that I care about, but it's not my, I'm not in your lane. Right. And I hated my lane so much that I would do anything to be in somebody else's lane telling them what to do. We exhausting. see that a lot. It's and so I think exhausting. also, too, though, you know, we we live We've in a society where point. it's almost like we feel like we're walking a tightrope from a young age. We have to check all these boxes. We have to be really good at this. We have to look good in this way. But then, like, we can't take it too far. You know, and, like, eating disorders as well. That's something else where there's all this pressure and then someone like becomes consumed with that pressure mm-hmm. and has, you know, a mental disorder. And then we're like, oh man, they like couldn't handle that. It's like, we're so unkind with our expectation of others mm-hmm. because we're not wanting to have a, t- a tough conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think there's an opportunity to be, I mean, if you're not going to be honest, you're not going to be able to change very much. If I can't be honest with the fact that my lifestyle's kicking my ass, I'm going to be stuck in that. It's going to take me out. Well, so let's talk about some ways for people, whether it's their own behavior yes, and their own concerns with mm-hmm. how they might be using alcohol yeah. or somebody that they love. They're seeing a pattern or they're having some concern. How do you address this? So let's start. Yeah. With how do you address it when it's you looking in the mirror? What do you, what's the conversation? Oh, it's, um, you know, it's just awful. I mean, it's just a- it's no matter how you slice it, it's no, there, it's not going to be good either way. I mean, I'm sure I had friends and family that were concerned and that was a, that wasn't a conversation I wanted to entertain. I didn't want to hear it. You know, I didn't want someone raining on my parade. Uh, and then it also, but so what ended up happening, I don't know, but it just, there's miracles that happen. I think when we're, if we're starting to do work, which I was, you know, like you I wasn't, were, I wasn't work, exactly yeah. doing recovery work or alcohol recovery work, but I was starting to heal myself and get, and get some tools. And so I was able to, I was starting to pull back the curtain a little bit. You know, I was starting to actually look at what it was and getting real with myself that I didn't think I really was going to get the life I wanted if I kept doing what I was doing. Okay. And that was, Definitely with my drinking, but also just where my time was being spent. You know, our priorities are reflected in where we spend money, where we spend time. And neither one of those I was proud of. You weren't going to get the life you wanted. You weren't going to also get the life you deserved. No. Like that, I was so far from that. And I was just kind of sick of myself. Like, I think at the very end of my drinking, I was breaking really simple promises to myself. And I felt like a fraud. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't this moment of really letting myself down. It was like a bunch of um, like a million moments of that yeah. compounding into one. Finally, I was like, you can't do anything you say you're going to do. Um, and I didn't feel heartbroken. I just felt like really done. Yeah. You know, yeah. like what is a certain, it was a certain a freaking gift of self-compassion in that moment that you gave yourself. Hmm. Because that is self-compassion to be like, look yeah. in the mirror, have the hard conversation and be like, girl, you have fucked up, but I love you anyway, because yeah. we're going to change this. Yeah. So that's the, I'm worthy yeah. of the change. I yeah. deserve the change. I can do this. I'm capable. Yeah. You know, there's so many other nuanced conversations that yeah. happened in that same moment that made you go game on. Yeah. And I don't think I even felt that much grace for myself really, but truly, I mean, that's what it is, is it started me down a path where I really started looking at, it was, and I'm like a do more person. Like what else can I do? What I really you started being was, that do more. it was like, what do I need to do less of in order to get what I want? And that's something that's stacked in my favor over the last, like, you know, four plus years is what do I, what can I actually take off my plate that is really sinking my ship. Like what can we throw off the boat 
that is weighing us down so that there's actually less in the boat. Like that's really the answer for me is to get more aligned and in sync with what really matters to me, what drives my passions, which makes me feel the most purposeful and useful, but also that brings me joy. Like there was no joy. I didn't know what I was good at. I didn't feel good about anything. Mm. I didn't. It was like, I didn't even feel like I was good at the things I was having to do every day. Like, so you're coaching people now and you've changed yeah. your entire life and trajectory yeah, life in four years. Like it's so years. radical. So if you don't like and where I'm, you're at in your life, all you have to do is just start, just start the conversation, right? Like we're saying, have the hard um, conversation, have the start hard conversation the, and start asking people like start, you trust. start to, yeah, start to ask for help, but from people who have something that you want. Right. So it's like, are you going to ask advice from someone who's in Like, are you going to ask relationship advice from someone who's in a horrible marriage? Negative. No. So, but you know, when you're, how you feel about yourself, like your vibration that you're at, it's reflected in everything around you. Mm -hmm. So I had to take a couple steps outside of that circle or like that vibrational circle I was in and reach a little bit outside. Mm -hmm. Um, and my therapist was huge for that. She really helped me, um, understand alcoholism as a disease that wasn't a con I mean there's alcoholism in my family as well it wasn't a conversation we were having it was just something that was shameful mm -hmm. um, and something that like should be kept under wraps right and that doesn't help anybody heal no so back to your your question about what to do if someone's struggling right um I think it I started pulling back the layers like I did change jobs I made a big career change within the year that I got sober and what that allowed me to do is I actually felt more joy. I liked what I was doing. I, I had excitement again, and my drinking was still an issue. So then it was like, okay, it's not my job. I was able to make enough. I started just getting some momentum of change for the better, and I could see more glaringly that my drinking was absolutely like the issue. Okay. Um, but if you're not knowing what to say to someone, I think telling someone that you're concerned or you're worried or you care mm -hmm. Anything that can be more compassionate than judgmental mm -hmm. is always going to be helpful. And if someone struggles with addiction, there's an awareness and there's a lot of shame of what we're not doing perfectly. And that's probably consuming us more than we're letting you know. And we're probably not going to be really nice to you when you bring this to our attention. But we already know. Right. Unless we're, it's not so, gonna be a news unless we're so in our disease that we have no recollection of what we're doing, which does happen sometimes, you know, so... I think it's, it's uncomfortable. I think there's a lot of resources like Al-Anon. There's other, uh, which is for friends and family of alcoholics. Like there's tools okay. for other people who are affected by these diseases. And there's so much drug addiction and drug use now, you know, kids, teenagers, people are being affected of all ages. And so tools for family members, they are out there and there can be support of how to take care of yourself so that you're not affected by this person's sickness. Mm -hmm. just like with an eating disorder, just like with someone who gambles, right? There's all this behavior yeah. that changes in yes. these relationships with people to try to cope. But part of it, I think, is we got to pull the sheets, pull mm -hmm. it back. Like, what are we dealing with? Mm -hmm. And that is something that is, I'm so grateful, is getting more common. We're breaking stigmas around mental health. You know, we're talking, we're pulling back and saying, what's going on here? This person needs help. And I think having people understand that struggle we're all struggling with something. We're all needing to recover from something. So if if you're going to judge me for what I'm being open about, you don't want to look at your own stuff because people who have been really supportive of me are people who are doing the work, mm -hmm. whether they're recovering alcoholics Whatever or type not. Of work. They yeah. understand what it means to to look and deal with them some things that are uncomfortable. Exactly. And for and those pain of, and shame. And for those of us who say I don't have any addiction in my family, I don't have anybody who has a problem there's something that you don't want to look at because the num you know, it's like the numbers, it's, it's the numbers show. So I think there's a lot of different ways people can get help. Um, what I do like about a 12 step program is it gives you framework to heal. Um, it's a free program, which is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is someone to be willing to get honest, you know? And so this is a challenging time right now for a lot of us humans, yes, right? We're in unprecedented stress and challenges. And so our tendencies and to isolation. want, and our tendencies to want to escape that is really real. Yeah. And so being able to find tools that help us 
stay well and healthy are really important. Uh, so I think, you know, it's hard. I think one of the reasons I'm open is because if, if someone else was struggling, you know, how would I, how would I want to lean in, you know? And when I was struggling, I did have one friend that at the time reached out to me. This is actually like a week before I stopped drinking. Um, so this was like April, 2016. She reached out to me and she was entering treatment for anxiety and alcohol. And I was really surprised that she was like, I didn't think, I didn't know she was struggling, but the one thing she said that stuck with me is she said, I just like, I don't, I don't have a handle on this. Like, I don't have control over this and I need help. And she's like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, oh, I'm like, that's yes. how I feel. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was thinking just how I, my life story, I have to find the solution before yeah. I can even talk about the problem. And that's just like, not fair. Right. How, how closed off we get if we live that way, you know, that we, we rob ourselves of the process of healing if we're like, okay, well, this this was the problem, but I've already figured out this is what I'm going to do about it. I was trying to like bridge that by myself in silence, you Impossible. know, in, in Impossible. isolation, and it was it was not working. And I was every time it didn't work, I was a, I was a bad person. Yeah. So I feel very free of that shame, and I've come to understand yeah. that everybody has something yes. that is holding them back from being their best. It's keeping them small. So some people will go their whole lives nursing. Like maybe you, maybe you aren't an alcoholic. Maybe you don't have an actual addiction, but you do something on a regular basis that totally trips you up. And that's over, not serving you. It's not serving you. And over time, that little trip up mm -hmm. stacks into this huge difference between who you could have been and who you actually are. And that's what was haunting me. Like I couldn't, I felt so outside myself. Yeah. But I did know that gap between where I wanted to be and like what you say, like now I know who, where I deserve to be mm -hmm. and where I actually, where my feet were actually standing was like the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now it's not that. It's, I mean, it's much closer together. And not only that, I can see a million different ways to keep getting closer to that person. Well, and that's and the journey. That's right? the journey. When you're, when you're in alignment and you're on the best path for you, you, it's always a journey. You never arrive at a place where you're like, oh, I got it all under control. But part of that is all these small wins along the way, all yes. these little mini races we're running and accomplishments and things we're part of that fill us up. It's like, that's what it's about. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And now you're coaching other people. I'm coaching Yay! other people. I'm helping people build businesses. So good. And I'm, what I was able to do is start to dream again, right? Yeah. Starting to have, as I healed, and explore I, your own potential yeah, and being able to tap into things that were really interesting to me without worrying about, is this paying me? Is this a good use of my time? It's just like, I was able to simply be, mm -hmm. and t you know, it's, I'm, I'm coaching people build businesses. It's a, it's a social marketing company. I'm, what I'm able to do is help people live better, feel better. And then they can go out and like be the best version of themselves. So like, what an honor. Um, exactly. But in order to do that, I continue to do the work. You have to. For myself. That's yeah. the only way. Mm -hmm. And to not be the smartest person in the room, right? <laughs> like, you're, you're, we are not. We're not. And Nobody we have to is. be looking who is farther ahead down a similar road and, and, and being willing to be, me again, honest, being mentored. What do I do about this? Like, you've been a huge support of just like, not being afraid to look at like, what could be better here? What could you do differently? What would make you feel more alive? Like if we can't have those conversations, I think it's scary to admit that maybe we're not where we want to be. Right. Well, we have we're, the best conversations because we're willing to dig into the well, crap. Right. But like for anyone, you know, if you're afraid to so say, good. Hey, maybe this isn't working for me anymore. Well, we're constantly evolving. And so things aren't going to fit us that used to fit us. Oh no. You, you know? have to build a new team. So and then that team evolves as you evolve as a human yeah. on your path. Right. And you know, that's definitely happened for you. And that's happened for me. Mm -hmm. You know, we have found other communities and other, just a, a team of people who yeah. believe in us yeah. and are, are going to help us reach our potential because yeah. we're doing that for others. We need the same thing. Yeah. We're all on the same path. You know, we're just in different places. Yeah. And there's so much, we don't have to be judgmental when we are where we want to be. You know, when we feel good about what we're doing, I'm Own not like, the victories. and it goes back to Own kind of like wins. taking care of yourself, that mm -hmm. self-care, like being in my lane, 
taking care, you know, like we say, like clean house. It's like taking care of your stuff yeah. so that you're good. And if I'm busy taking care of myself, I'm able, like, I feel better. I'm able to lean into things that need me, but I'm also not like looking over my neighbor's fence. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have time to get into someone else's business no. or be critical of someone else yeah. because I'm feeling good. Right. You know, it's like, that's such a relief that I am not preoccupied by so many things that don't bring me joy. And that's not what coaching is. So that's kind of an interesting thing that you brought up as we wrap here. Like, you know, you and I are both coaching in different yeah. capacities, but um, because we love humans and we love the journey and the work so yeah. much, but that's not what coaching is, is peeking over people's fences, you know, no. helping them clean up their yard. No. What the people that are drawn to you or drawn to me or drawn to us in our community are very much the people that are on similar paths. They just need the team mates to help yeah. them get there, you know, yeah. um, the tools, the resources and so forth. And we want to be those yeah. people for, for them. And you helping know? someone, you know, on their path. It's incredibly rewarding. See, sometimes there's like these invisible roadblocks, right? There's these things that we can't see that others can see for us, just like we can see potential in people when they can't see it. Yeah. So what's nice is it's about collaboration and it's about encouragement, but also it's about setting an example, right? Like yeah. I'm, I'm not an example of being perfect, an no. example of being human and, and of feeling fear and doing it anyway. Oh, hell yeah. All the time. Every and day. And so I think <laughs> those feelings that used to keep me stuck propel me now. And that's, yeah. that's the difference. Like, what used to be such a like a crutch or used to be like my Achilles heel it's like that is now my superpower because I've been able to flip it around yeah. do the work on it and see like I was always supposed to be a deep feeling motivated mm -hmm. person like that was always part of my path you have now, huge I'm, heart. now I'm using it for good for myself yeah. and other people as opposed to using it as a form of like self-punishment mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or toughness, you know? And so being disciplined, being committed, those are things that are required when we're elevating ourselves, but having a more reasonable approach, like now I'm trying to find that like gooey middle of places. That's really, that's like more fun, right? Mm -hmm. Of how do I want to move my body today? How do I want to nourish my spirit today? How am I going to, what am I going to eat? That's healthy, like having a kinder approach. And I continue to, to read, to listen to things, to, to look at who are people that are putting out information on how we can, these little hacks, yeah. right, that improve our day to day, that gives me time. If I have more time, there's more I can experience. And we have limited time. We do. So we have to make it count. So and I think that yeah. that's really the reality of where we're at today. Yeah. And we're just going to stay at it. And that's why, you know, I call you a love warrior. You're a love yeah. boss. That's yeah. your self title. Yeah. Love boss. It's like, it's my business. You're in the business of yeah, of loving people. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I hope you keep at it for the rest of your life. <laughs> I hope yeah. you never get so good at it that you relax. <laughs> Just kidding. I know you relax. And when you do, it is yeah. a critical part of the journey. And, yeah. And we all need that too. Yeah. So keep on you have some fun. And you have to be able to laugh at yourself, you know? Oh yeah. I used to we be laugh. so, just so hard on myself and it's, that's not where the grace is, you know? Yeah. All right, ladies. Another this good chat. So good. <laughs> Thank love you. you. Love Thanks you. for everything. See you soon. Okay. Sounds okay, everybody. Good. And that's a wrap. Put down the drink, pick up your life, go have some fun. Yes, please. Thank you for connecting with us for this episode of the Endurance Town USA Project. Discover more about today's guest, along with other great stories and video projects, by visiting us online at endurancetownusa.com. You can also follow us for updates and behind the scenes peeks at future episodes on Instagram at endurancetownusa. You can also connect with our creator, host, and life leadership and business coach, Samantha Pruitt, at samanthapruitt.com or on Instagram at the Samantha Pruitt. And lastly, you can follow me, Travis Ford, producer and marketing creative at rockharbormarketing.com or Instagram at rockharbormarketing. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time we go on an adventure to Endurance Town, USA. Bring it back.